Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We put these podcasts out on the second Wednesday of every month. Today, I want to talk about two enormous benefits of spending time in the secret place. When when I was in college, for a couple of years, I worked as a telemarketer. And some days I would get up and there would be time to go to work and I just would not feel like being a telemarketer. I didn't feel like uh, annoying people with phone calls because nobody likes a telemarketer. I didn't feel like getting rejected, getting hung up on. I didn't feel like any of that, but I still felt like getting paid. So what I would do, and I know this is terrible, but I would, I would go ahead and go to work and I would go and sit at my little desk in the telemarketing room and I would pick up the phone and pretend to make calls and I would even make little nonsense notes on my note card uh, and do all of that, but I wouldn't actually make any phone calls. And so I was doing a lot of the stuff that goes along with telemarketing. I showed up to work on time. I was uh, pushing buttons and holding the phone and sitting at my desk and writing stuff down. But I wasn't doing what really was the key aspect of telemarketing. I wasn't calling anybody or, or making any sales, which is really the essence, the, the main part of being a telemarketer. So I was just going through, going through motions. And without that essential part, the motions were really just uh, completely unneeded. Maybe, maybe there's some area in your life where you found yourself just going through the motions. It can happen in all kinds of different areas, in different situations that we're in. But one area that something very similar can happen is in our walk with the Lord. In our relationship with the Lord, we can uh, be doing a lot of stuff. We can be going to church singing the songs, serving, giving, getting up in the morning and reading our little devotional. And all of that is great, but sometimes we can be missing what is, what is essential, the main part of it, which is fellowship and intimacy, genuine relationship with the Lord. And this is, this is nothing new. This is something that people have been doing for a long, long time. Way back in the Old Testament, you can read about God dealing with his people when in their relationship with him, They were just going through motions and they were missing the key part, the essence of what serving the Lord was all about. You can read about it in the book of Jeremiah, in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1 deals with it. In the book of Amos, uh, in the book of Malachi. Over and over again, people would come to the temple. They'd even bring sacrifices and offerings. They would sing the songs and go through the motions, but that's all that it was. And God would say things like, you're just trampling my courts. Just don't even bother coming. Or "I, I reject your offerings. You're, you, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is, is far from me. So it, God wants relationship. He wants, he wants intimacy. And without that, everything else is motions. But before we go any further, uh, I want to balance that a little bit. When we talk about relationship with the Lord, sometimes you'll hear people say, you know, Christianity isn't religion, it's, it's relationship. And that's true, but sometimes people will say that and it just be really an excuse of being lazy in their relationship. That anytime you want to talk about requirements or criteria, some responsibility they have in serving the Lord, they will push back against that by saying Christianity is just relationship. And, and they will be using that as a way to be negligent and lazy in the very relationship that they're claiming that they're claiming to defend. In a healthy relationship, there are guidelines and responsibilities. And it's true in our relationship with the Lord. It's true in any healthy relationship. In my relationship with my wife, it's exactly that. At its essence, my marriage, it is a relationship. But to keep it healthy and strong, there are expectations and guidelines and certain criteria that needs to be, to be met to keep it healthy and to keep it flourishing. My wife expects me to sleep at my house tonight. And if I just don't show up, I can't explain to her like, hey, this is all about relationship. But because it's about relationship, there's guidelines that help protect and and keep structure and keep that relationship, keep that relationship strong. It's true in our relationship with the Lord as well. Let, Let me read to you from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. It says, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. He's giving specifications or criteria 
for our relationship with the Lord. You will seek me and you'll find me when. There, there's a certain requirement that needs to be met in order to have intimacy with the Lord, to really know his presence, to really know fellowship with him. He says not, not when it's a, some casual side interest that we have, not when we approach him as just something we're interested off on the periphery of our, our life somewhere, that's something we're, we're, we like it, we're into it. We seek him 75% or 90%. He says, you'll seek me and you'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart. That's, that's the criteria. So even our relationship with the Lord has that requirement on it if we want it to really flourish. That when we acknowledge, God, there's nothing in my life that I pursue. There's nothing that I desire that compares with you. And we, we start our days acknowledging it, but then actually living our life in line with that acknowledgement. God, as I start today, I, I, I've got to have you. I want you more than I want anything else. We'll search for him and we'll find him when we seek him with all, with all of our hearts. When we search for him, not when we search for peace not when we seek for provision or anointing or power or joy. Those are all wonderful things that are found in him, but that's not our pursuit. He said, when you search for me, when you seek me, you'll find me, that he's what we're after. Father, I know I need power. I know I need to be led. I know I need your strength today, but God, I, I want you. And I know if I find you, I've found everything that I'll ever need. And if I have all these other things, but I don't have you, I know that I don't, I don't stand a chance, that we need to seek the Lord with all of our heart. And this isn't just an Old Testament thing. It says this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse six, it says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Diligently means to exert considerable effort and care. To exert considerable effort and care. Does that describe the way that you seek the Lord? Because a lot of believers, a lot of Christians, seek the Lord with minimal effort. That they just maybe go to church uh, once or twice a month. They get up in the morning, maybe they'll, they'll flip through a devotional, read something so they can read off their check off their Bible reading plan, uh, maybe say a, a quick prayer on, in the car on their way to work. There's nothing necessarily wrong with any of that, but it doesn't describe someone who is diligently seeking the Lord to exert considerable effort, to lean in, to press in. God, I'm seeking you. I'm putting effort into this relationship with you. It's not just empty motions. I'm diligently seeking the Lord. And that's what leads us to the topic of the secret place. And I want to talk again about two enormous benefits of spending time in the secret place. I want to read to you from Psalm chapter 91, just the first couple of verses. It says this, starting in verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him I will trust. He who dwells in the, in the secret place. Now, when he's talking about the secret place, he's not talking about church attendance. And church attendance is wonderful. I'm a pastor. I love the gathering of the believers. Or there's something special about the, the body of Christ being together, worshiping together. In the next Psalm, uh, Psalm 92, we quote from it every week at our church, that those who are planted in the house of God flourish in the courts of God. That is important. But what he's talking about with the benefits of the secret place, he's talking about a one-on-one -on -one encounter with the Lord. Even the, the language that he's using, he who dwells, not those who dwell, or not they who dwell. It's talking about an individual. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. He is, is my fortress. An individual personal relationship with the Lord that is cultivated not just in the corporate gathering, in the secret place where it's just you and the Lord spending time together. I don't know if you've ever had a group of friends where there's five or six, seven or eight of you that spend time together. You just like to get together and hang out and you're friends with everyone. But maybe there's that one person that if you two are ever left alone in a room together, everyone else goes in the other room. It's just kind of awkward. You're all friends but when it's one-on-one -on -one with that person, it's just a little bit uncomfortable. If you guys have to catch a ride together and there's no one else with you, it just becomes uh, awkward, 
conversation is awkward. You're just kind of waiting for somebody else to, to join in. So you, Because you're friends with them in a group setting, but one-on-one it becomes very uncomfortable and you're not good at relating like that. I feel like a lot of Christians are in a similar situation in their relationship with the Lord. That in a corporate setting, they love the Lord as long as there's a, a worship leader up there leading the songs and lots of people singing. They love the presence of God. If there's a pastor bringing God's word to them, they, they love it. But when it comes to one-on-one, them getting up in the morning and just spending time alone with the Lord, it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. They just know him in a corporate setting. And a corporate setting is wonderful. It's beneficial. It's necessary but we've got to have a personal relationship with the Lord and to cultivate that. And again, that happens in the secret place. In Matthew chapter 25, there's a story of 10 virgins who went out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them ran out of oil in their lamps and five of them still had oil in their lamp. And when the bridegroom came, the ones that were ready with oil were able to go with him and the others were not. Now, corporately, they, they were okay. Corporately, when they were all together, they had lamps that were on. They had light. There was oil in the, in the mix. Some of them had oil. So corporately, they were okay, but they weren't going to stand before the bridegroom corporately. They were going to stand before him as individuals. And when those five realized that they didn't have oil in their lamp, and oil is a picture of intimacy, the flow of God's presence in our lives, the, the, the Holy Spirit filling us. When those five realized they didn't have oil in their lamp, They couldn't just share it with the others. They were directed back to the source. You've got to go to the source yourself. Go to the store. You've got to buy it on your own. We can't share share it with you. So we've got to have an individual encounter, a a personal relationship with the Lord in the secret place. It says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust. Back to verse 1, it says, I will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If we read down to verse 4, it says, he will cover you with the feathers, with his feathers, and under his wing you shall take refuge. That's talking about closeness. For someone to be in your shadow, they're close by. Then that, that analogy of being under his wing, like a, a baby bird or a chick under its parent's wing, that's close. Just your head on his chest being drawn close, just you and the Lord. That We need, we need that time. You need to have time in the secret place where you hide yourself away with the Lord. Now, when we talk about the secret place, it's not necessarily a requirement that you have a room that you call your secret place. That's your prayer closet. If you do, there's nothing wrong with that. But the idea is just having some time that you carve out where you get alone with the Lord. Mine changes. Sometimes my secret place is in a room in my basement, sometimes in my kitchen, Sometimes it's outside by my garage. Sometimes it's in my office. It, it's someplace where you, where you know it's just you and the Lord. I like making sure that nobody else can hear me. I don't have to be self-conscious. I can, I can laugh. I can cry. I can get loud. Uh, I, can, I can just know it's just me and the Lord and nobody else is listening in. I can just pour out my heart to the Lord. You need to have time where it's just you alone with the Lord. Even in the natural, there are things that can be said in certain settings that can't be said in other settings. So the, your environment and your setting matter and to some extent dictate the level of relating that is going to happen. You know, on a Sunday morning, I, I can have a lot of conversations with a lot of different people. Just general chit-chat happening in the hallway, in the lobby, just, hey, how are you doing? But sometimes somebody will want to say something at a different level, a little more sensitive or a little more private, and we might, we might step over to the side of the room or, or step off into a hallway where, where we're a little more secluded, and then they can share something that they wouldn't feel comfortable sharing when there's lots of people around. We can relate differently. Or sometimes, if it's really private and really sensitive, I might say, well, why don't you just come to my office and we can talk alone there. And in that setting, they can share things and I can share things with them that we couldn't share when there's lots of people around. And that's just in you know personal relationships. What about things that God wants to say to you or you need to, to pour out your heart to him? There's a certain setting that that can happen in other settings where, where it'll never happen. You need to have time in the secret place. In my relationship with my wife, there's, there's levels of affection and relating that can happen when there's people around. If you were to spend time and my wife and I were there, you could probably pick up, even if you didn't know, that's probably his wife by the way that we talk. Maybe we hold hands 
or I put my arm around her, or you know, just the way we interact, you could say, okay, that must, they must be husband and wife. But I can tell you there is a, a level of intimacy that we share that only happens when we are alone together. Only in a, a secret, secluded place does that level of relating and intimacy happens. And something is similar in our walk with the Lord. There's a lot of great fellowship and wonderful things that happen corporately, but there are certain things that only happen in a private, in a private setting. And not to, not to be crude or graphic, but I, I'll, I'll say this as well. But we have four children, and all, all four of our children came about as a result of time where my wife and I were alone together in that secret place, that there was certain fruitfulness in our life that only came about as a result of spending time alone, certain fruit that everyone can see that came as a result of something that happened where no one could see. And so that brings us to the two things that I want to talk about, two incredible benefits of spending time in the secret place. I want to read to you from Psalm 139, starting in verse 7. It says this, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. And he continues, he's talking about the presence of God and how God's presence is everywhere. And we, we know that God is omnipresent. He, his, his presence is felt all, his presence is all over, but it's not experienced the same all over. There are certain settings that we experience his presence different than in others. A couple of verses later, he continues, verse 13, he says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in, in the depths. So he's talking about, obviously on one level, how a baby is formed in its mother's womb. You made me. You made me in my mother's womb. You formed me in the secret place. So he's talking about a baby being formed in his mother's womb, but there is a parallel of what happens in this. He uses that term, the secret place, in our relationship with the Lord. So the first benefit is that the secret place is a place of formation. The secret place is a place of of formation, where God can mold you and shape you and develop you as a man of God, as a woman of God. I love the illustration or the idea of clay being put on a potter's wheel. And sometimes, a lot of times, that's what I have in my mind when I begin to spend time with the Lord in the secret place. As I begin to pray, as I begin to worship Him and, and seek Him, in my mind, I have this picture of a piece of clay being put on a potter's wheel. And I'm I'm making myself available to the Lord. I'm making myself vulnerable to him. I'm, I'm getting alone with him. God, mold me and shape me, remove things that need to be removed, put things in me that need to be added. Just uh, put your hands on me and mold me. The secret place is a place of formation. He says, I was made in the secret place. That's where people are made and developed. There's a lot of Christians that are underdeveloped because they neglect spending time in the secret place. It's a place of formation. And time matters when you spend time in the secret place. Uh, a baby in his mother's womb needs to be in that place for a certain length of time. If you asked a doctor, would it be better if I carried this baby uh, for four months, or would it be better if I carried this baby for eight months? The doctor would probably say, well, it'd be better better if you carried it for eight months. I mean, nine months would be ideal, but eight months would be better than four months because the time that you spend in there matters. The development that happens, the, the formation that is occurring, the time that we spend with the Lord, time matters. It's not, it's not everything, but it, it does play a role. On the night when Jesus was betrayed in the garden and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said, could you not pray with me for one hour? There was a, there was a time amount of time that he had in his mind. The disciples didn't say, hey, Jesus, don't you know it's not about religion, it's about relationship. No, that, that time mattered in the time they were willing to spend seeking the Lord and spending time in prayer. When a, a baby does not spend enough time in the secret place of the womb, it's going to be susceptible to things 
that a baby who spent longer in the womb wouldn't be susceptible to. It would be, it would be weaker. So that's the second thing I wanted to talk about. Number one, the secret place is a place of formation. You need to spend time, carve out time on a regular basis, a daily basis to hide yourself away, to come up under the, the wing of the Most High and allow Him just, just to fellowship with you. And while you're fellowshipping, pouring out your heart, listening for His voice, He's forming you, molding you, making you, developing gifts. Some people have gifts in them that will never come to fruition because they're, they're underdeveloped, like a, a baby born prematurely. You've got to spend time in that secret place to be formed and mold, molded and shaped. The second thing is that the secret place is a place to gain strength. Let me read to you from Psalm 27, starting in verse 13. David says this, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I want to read the next verse, but he's saying, listen, I would have given up. I would have quit. I would have just been too weak to continue Unless I had believed, unless something had sparked faith and hope in my heart to cause me to believe that I'm, I'm going to see the goodness of God. This situation is going to turn around. I have reason to hope. God's going to come through for me. This, this isn't the end. I would have despaired unless I had believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, how did he, how did he make that change from despair to hope and looking forward? Well, he tells us in the next verse, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. He's given us the secret of how he went from, man, I was about to call it quits. I would have despaired. I was in depression. I didn't see a way out. But then something happened. I began to believe. He's I began to wait on the Lord. That word wait means to look for the Lord. He spent time seeking God. He spent time in the secret place. And he's emphasizing it. That that's what we should do. He gives that instruction. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And this is not just some random verse. This is something we see in Scripture. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Those who wait on the Lord. Just wait. Don't be in such a hurry. Don't be ready to run off and start your day. Just hold on. Wait. Take some time. Get in the secret place. Spend that time with the Lord. And instead of just going through the day and falling into despair, getting discouraged, going through the day underdeveloped, weak, it says you, you can renew your strength. You find strength as you wait on the Lord. Let me read one more passage and we'll pray. Psalm, Psalm 61. Psalm 61, starting in verse 1, it says, Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Again, situation where he goes from being overwhelmed, goes from being overwhelmed to a high, a high rock. How did he end up there? Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you, have shelter, for you have been a shelter to me, a strong tower from the enemy. Let me start in verse 1 again. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Verse 3. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. I'll trust in the shelter of your wings. That, that's, that's secret place talk. That's back to Psalm 91. I find shelter under the shadow of your wings. That the way he went from overwhelmed, how he handled that situation, was trusting in the shelter of the Lord's wings. I, I want to challenge you, if you don't do it, to carve out time where you can get alone, find a spot, make it a daily practice to invest in the secret place. It's a place of formation, it's a place where you will gain strength to trust in the shelter, the protection of his wings that's found in the secret place. There's so much more to talk about with benefits of the secret place. Maybe we'll get into that next time again, second Wednesday of every month. We'll release one of these podcasts. Until then, thank you so much for joining us today.